I uh, wanted to come to the floor today. Um, I think the good news is that I've read recently that the Senate's going to spend the next couple of weeks, maybe the whole month, talking about tax policy. And I think that's very encouraging because uh, this is one of the issues I was hoping we would deal with early when I got here last year. And I'm quite frankly surprised that it's taken a year and a half to pivot to this issue, but I'm glad we're finally on it. And I'm hopeful, uh, I don't know if that's been determined yet, but I'm hopeful that on this legislation that's currently before the Senate, that the minority will be given an opportunity to introduce ideas. I think that's important for this place to work well. Um, I read the history of this distinguished place, and it only works well, it only functions when both sides, are their ideas are allowed to be heard. Um, I know that we can count votes here, and from time to time we may have a chance to pass a few things, but when you're in the minority as I am, It'll be harder for us to get some ideas passed, but I'd love to at least be able to get a vote on some of these ideas that we're hoping to push forward, and, and our hope is that that will happen. So uh, let's hope that that works out. But what I wanted to talk about today uh, a little bit is to kind of remind us of what our goal is in all these conversations, because ultimately I think that's important. If you can't arrive at the right solutions, if you don't know what it is, if you don't know exactly where it is you're trying to get to, our goal. I believe, and this is a consensus now throughout this country, and I think it's actually something that unites both political parties. Our goal needs to be to grow the economy. That's our goal, to grow the economy. And what it, what it means, what, when you grow the economy, good things happen for everybody. Now, how does the economy grow is the first fundamental question we have to understand. The economy grows when two things happen. Either someone starts a business or someone grows their existing business. That's what leads to economic growth. It's, it's that simple, really. Someone starts a new business because they think they can make money at it, or someone goes into their existing business and says, I think we can make more money. Let's grow this thing. That's how the economy grows. And so the issue before us here as federal policymakers has to be, what can we do? What can the federal government do to help that kind of growth? In essence, what can the federal government do to encourage people and make it easier for people to either start a business or to grow their business. And if that is our goal, then every, then every time a measure comes before this body, tax policy, regulatory policy, what we should ask ourselves is, does this make it easier or harder for someone to start a business? Does it make it easier or harder for someone to grow an existing business? Does this measure make it easier or harder for the economy to grow? Because if we are indeed united by this goal of growing the economy, that should be the measure of anything that we take on. And it's through that lens that I want to examine some of the things we're talking about right now. Because it seems to me, at least in some of the policies that I've heard proposed this week, that maybe some folks have the goal wrong. Because if you closely examine some of these policies, it sounds like the goal is, let's take a limited economy that isn't growing, and let's divide it up. And primarily, it sounds like, let's take this limited economy that isn't growing, and let's allow us to take money from people that maybe are making a little too much, so you can give it to the government, and the government can spend it on behalf of people that maybe aren't making enough. Now, I know that may sound appealing to some folks that are in the part of, the, of those Americans that aren't making enough money, but I want you to know something. It never works. That idea never works. Here's why it never works. It actually never works because, first of all, the money doesn't get to you. When you give government money to spend, it invariably doesn't usually spend it very well. And in fact, when you give government money to spend, the people who end up getting that money are the people who can afford to hire people to come to Washington and influence how the money is spent. So sometimes the money never even gets to you if, in fact, you allow the government to do this. But it's more complicated than that, really. It can actually cost people their jobs. And here's why. How you create businesses or how you expand an existing business is pretty straightforward. Someone is in business, someone makes some money or gets a hold of some money, and they decide to take that money and invest it. They use the money they've made, and they, they reinvest it back in their business so that the business grows, or they use the money they've made to start a brand new business. This stuff works. This is how the American economy has grown and how we became the most prosperous people on the earth. And I don't just know that it works because I read about it in a magazine. I know that it works because I lived it. As I've detailed and talked about in the past on this floor, my father was a bartender. That's what he did. He worked at hotels as a bartender. My mom was a lot of different jobs, but for a while she worked, for example, as a maid on a hotel as well. The reason why I tell you that is because the reason why my mom and dad had a job 
that paid the money so they could raise us and give us the chance to do all the things that me and my siblings have been able to do is because somebody made some money and they took that money and opened up this hotel. That's why my parents had a job. They didn't have a job because the President of the United States back in 1965 or 1975 gave them a job. They had a job because someone who made money took that money they had and used it to start a new business or to grow an existing business and hire them. They also had a job because other people who had money decided to use that money to go on vacation. And they came to Miami Beach or they came to Las Vegas when I lived in Las Vegas. And they spent that money at these hotels. The point is that people had money and they either invested it or spent it. And it allowed a bartender and a maid, my mother and father, to raise me and our siblings and to give us opportunity. That was true in the 50s, in the 60s, in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s. It's still true. That's what you need to grow this economy. And the problem is that if you go after these people, if you go after this money that they've made and you give it to the government, maybe they'll decide not to open up that new business. Maybe they'll decide this is not the year to take that vacation. Or instead of taking the five-day vacation, they take the three-day vacation. And you know who gets hurt? The bartender and the maid. The people that work at these places. Because there's only, money has to go somewhere. And if you're taking it out of the hands of the people who invest it and spend it, they can't invest it, they can't spend it. And it's people that are trying to make it like my parents were, who get hurt by it. So we've got to get our goal right. Because if our goal is to grow the economy, we don't have to call trick plays. What we can do at the federal level to grow the economy is pretty straightforward. All you have to do is talk to the people who grow the economy. Go out there and talk to the people who have a great idea and are trying to start a business. They'll tell you what they're looking for. It's pretty straightforward stuff. Tax reform. What do we mean by tax reform? It's simple. We want a tax code that's stable, predictable, and affordable. Of course we have to have taxes. Government needs revenue to be able to pay for the things that we all expect from government. But it has to be a predictable system, and it has to be an affordable system. You see, if your taxes get too high, people may decide, not to invest it in this country, or to leave it in the bank. And that doesn't help anybody. And so the point is that we need to have a tax code that's stable, predictable, and affordable. We need regulations that are the same, stable, affordable, and predictable. Now look, we need to have regulations, right? I mean, I want this water to be clean. I don't want that water to poison me. We don't want to walk out on the street and, and, and breathe in air that's gonna hurt us. There's a role for regulation. The problem is, that most federal regulations are set by bureaucrats for, that work for the government. And all they think about is, can this regulation maybe help? They don't think at all about what the impact of that regulation is gonna be on businesses. That's not part of the equation. When they sit down and write a regulation, that's not part of the equation at all. And so you end up having these regulations that may not even help that much, but hurt a lot. That help wipe out entire industries but whose impact on helping the environment or something else is nebulous at best. And so we've got to change that. And that's why we need to pass a law here like the RAINS Act, which says that any regulation that has an economic impact beyond a certain amount of money should have to be approved by elected people who are accountable, who have to measure both the effectiveness of the regulation, but also whether it's going to cost jobs or wipe out an industry, because that's important too. Protecting our industries and our source of job creation is just as important as some of these other things that we're trying to protect through regulations. And they have to be balanced against one another, not simply made a decision in a vacuum. Along those lines, something that's both a tax and a regulation is Obamacare. Now look, we have a health insurance problem in America. There's no denying that. But there are better ways to deal with it. And the problem is that this bill that passed has created a tremendous amount of uncertainty. For example, it says if you have more than 50 full-time employees, these are certain requirements you're going to have to meet. So imagine if you're a company with 48 or 49 employees. This may not be the year to hire the 50th. And maybe you were going to be the 50th, but now you don't get hired. Or worse, maybe you'll decide this is the year to turn all my employees into part-time employees. That's not good for the workers. And yet that's the impact this law is having, not to mention the fact that it's a tax increase. That's what the IRS does. The IRS collects taxes. And guess who you have to prove to that you have insurance? 
And not just any old insurance, but it's insurance that they deem to be acceptable, the IRS. Millions of Americans now every year will have to prove to the IRS that they have insurance or you owe the IRS money. That's a tax. And that's not going to help job creation, especially if you're a small business. I outlined this last week. Imagine a small business run by a husband and wife with two kids and the business, not them, the business makes $95,000 a year. It would cost them between four to $6,000 to buy health insurance. If they don't, they will owe the IRS $2,000. Now you tell me that's good for that business. Or imagine if you're thinking about going into business and you realize that this is what's gonna happen to you, you decide not to go into business. That's not good for growth. That's why this law needs to be repealed and it needs to be replaced. Something else we need is how about a pro-American energy policy? Do people realize that the American innovator has come up with this technology over the last five years that now has made us a very energy rich country? I don't know if people fully understand how energy rich America is. You want a small glimpse of what it can mean to our future? Go to North Dakota. That's having a jobs boom. They can't find enough people to work there because energy is important. We need to start behaving like an energy rich country with a true all of the above strategy where the energies we choose, by the way, are decided by the marketplace, not by a politician. When politicians decide which energy source to get, guess, you know who wins? The people with the best lobbyists, the people with the best lobby, the people with the most political influence. That's how you get a Solyndra type situation where a company that was gonna go bankrupt gets all this money of your tax dollars. Meanwhile, America is sitting on over a hundred and some odd years of natural gas at our disposal and no concise national energy policy to utilize it. Let me tell you why energy matters. Because if we can get energy costs down and stable and predictable, manufacturing will start coming back to America. That's one of the leading, that's one of the leading costs of manufacturing is energy. We're an energy rich country. Some of those factories that close, we can actually get them to come back here. Imagine what that would do for economic growth. Not to mention the fact that America could potentially now begin to sell overseas as well, creating yet another industry and all the things that come with it. How about free and fair trade? You know, there's this emerging middle class all over the world now. One of the great things that's happened over the last 20 years is that all over the world, there are people that just a decade ago were living in poverty that now can afford to buy the stuff we invent and build. People all over the world, by the way, that can now afford to take vacations. And you know where they want to come? To the United States of America. They want to come to Florida, but they also want to go to all kinds. They want to come here. I think that's fantastic. That now that there are millions of people all over the world that can afford to visit the United States and leave their money at our hotels, at our restaurants, at our amusement parks, that creates jobs. That creates growth. Free and fair trade that allows the American people to build things that we can sell overseas to other places and lowers the cost of buying certain things here. Just last year, we ratified the free trade agreement with Colombia, Panama, and South Korea. We are already seeing the economic benefits of that in South Florida. Imagine if we were able to do that with more countries in a free and fair way. It has to be fair. One last thing we could probably do to help grow this economy is deal with the long-term debt. And that's what it is. It's a long-term debt problem that hovers over all of this conversation and creates uncertainty. People are afraid, especially people with lots of money, are afraid to invest in the American economy because they look at this debt problem, they look at this political process as inability to deal with it, and they think, you know what, that country's destined for confiscatory tax rates. They're going where Europe's going. We don't want to invest in a country that's going to wind up like Europe in five years. That's why we have to deal with the long-term debt. The sooner the better. And to deal with the long-term debt, by the way, you have to deal with what's causing it. That's why it's so important we save Medicare. Medicare is a very important program. My mother's on Medicare. I would never support anything that hurts my mother or people like her. But people in my generation need to understand that if we want to keep Medicare the way it is for our parents, and we want Medicare to even exist when we retire, Medicare is going to have to look different for us, for 41-year-olds. We have to save Medicare. 
And to, say, to deal with a long-term debt, we have to deal with that. That's what's driving part of the debt. That's not being driven by foreign aid, which is less than 1% of our budget. The debt's not being driven by food stamp programs. The debt's not being driven by defense spending. Now look, if money's being misspent or wasted, it's never a good idea to do that. If there are ways to save money in foreign aid, we should save it. If there are ways to save money in the, in the food stamp program, we should save it. If there are ways to save money in the defense budgets, we should save it. But that's not what's driving our long-term debt. And to pretend that we're going to get 100% of our savings from 25 or 20% of our budget leads to the kind of catastrophic cuts that we talk about in this town. Because no one wants to touch the big issues. That has to be dealt with. Now, what would happen if we did these six things? Let's say that tomorrow, overnight, magically, these things, things happen. We got real tax reform, real regulatory reform. We repealed and replaced Obamacare. We had a pro-American energy strategy. We expanded free and fair trade. And we had a plan in place that began to deal with the long-term debt in a serious and sustainable way. Let me tell you what would happen. Explosive economic growth, primarily by the creation of jobs. And you know what more jobs means? It means, number one, more taxpayers. That means you can now generate revenue for government to pay for the kinds of stuff that we all want government to do, and you don't have to take raise tax rates to do that. It means you have more taxpayers who are now paying into the tax system that give you the revenue you need to bring the debt under control. Everything gets easier if the economy grows. The debt gets easier, our budgets get easier. Let me tell you what that jobs also means, more customers for your business. If someone's unemployed, it's hard for them to spend money. It's hard for them to buy a house, much less the things that go in it. It's hard for them to take vacations. More jobs means more stability for your business or for the place you work in. More jobs means more taxpayers. It means more customers for your business. And by the way, it means a more stable society, a place where people, hard work, can earn them a decent wage so they can save money for their kid's college, so they can save money for their retirement so they can buy a home and furnish it, so they can afford to take a couple weeks vacation a year with their families. Millions of Americans can't do that anymore. Millions of Americans have done everything we've asked of them. They went to school, they graduated. They were told that if they did that, they could find a job that paid them a decent wage, and they're struggling to do that now. Now, by the way, all the strategies for growth aren't at the federal level. It's important that states take on the issue of education reform. It's important for us as parents to be honest with our kids. In the 21st century, it's going to be really hard to find a job if all you have is a high school diploma. It's just that simple. You look at the unemployment rate between people that have a college degree or a post-high school degree and those that don't, it's stunning. If you don't have more than high school education, you are going to struggle to succeed in this new century. We have to let our kids understand that. It's our jobs as parents and as a community to do that. By the way, it's important for us to work with the states, as I outlined earlier, to modernize our education system. Why have we stigmatized career education? Why can't we graduate kids from high school with both a diploma and an industry certification in a career? We need to begin to teach our kids to compete with the world not just with other states. These are other things that have to happen as well. Ultimately, look, I think that the, the point I want to drive today is we need to remind ourselves of what the goal is here. The goal is growth. The goal is what can we do at the federal level to help grow the economy. Ultimately, the economy grows because of the private sector. Because someone who has made some money takes that money and invests it by starting a new business or by growing their existing business. And we should find ways to make that easier and encourage people to do that. That has to be our goal. It doesn't require trick plays. It doesn't require some complicated new gimmick. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. The American people haven't run out of good ideas. Americans haven't forgotten how to start businesses or even entire new industries. Even as I speak to you right now, I am 100% convinced that within walking distance of this building, there is someone somewhere drawing up the next great American company business plan on the back of a napkin or a scrap piece of paper. And if we gave them a chance to do it, they're going to do it. 
We are still the same people that we've always been. There's nothing wrong with the American people. They just need a little help from the government. And I think if we get our goals right around here, we can do a few simple but important things that allow Americans to do once again what we do better than any country or any people in the history of the world. And that's create prosperity and create opportunity. So thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I yield the floor.